Hello, this is Debbie Kay with the League of Women Voters of Portland. You're watching Video Voters Guide. We're here with Metro East Community Media to talk with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Polo. He's running for Portland City Commissioner, position two. Welcome, Polo. Please tell us a little about yourself, why you're running for this office, what unique characteristics you bring all the candidates for this position. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I am what's known as a Spammy, a Spanish-speaking Asian Muslim island boy. And then I'm also an Anglo-American lawyer, so that makes me an all Spammy. I suppose that makes me uh, somewhat different from most people in the room, in any room at any time. Uh, our family, our refugee family, was sponsored by uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church. And even till this day, our parents, myself, my children, and my grandchildren are, are so grateful. Uh, to Grandpa uh, Bob and Ruby Hawkins, Grandma Ruby Hawkins, for, for teaching us about America. The kindness was uh, un, un, unimaginable. Um, another thing I bring to this race, I bring, uh, our campaign brings to City Hall, I hope, is that since uh, 1984, I've designed practical and uh, strategic solutions, uh, and then carefully developed partnerships uh, to solve some of our urban urgencies. And these partnerships are with governments, several local government schools, communities, businesses, faith, civil society associations. Um, and among the things we tackled was neighborhood livability, uh, community policing, environmental stewardship. And then my biggest fave of all is participation in, in, in local democracy uh, by all our communities. Thank you. Sure. The COVID-19 pandemic and the devastation of small business, city employee layoffs, and housing displacement will be with us for some time. How would you seek to address the fallout from this, including the reduction in city? Yeah, you know, I, I, um, it's impossible for me to, um, to overstate the amount of sorrow that many Portlanders are feeling. Um, or to overestimate how big the abyss will be uh, when our economy gets rolling again and people are coming out of their homes and going back to the joy of, of Portland. Um, what I can say, though, with some confidence is that what has worked um, in the four decades or so that I've been uh, a local activist lawyer and community building, what has always worked for us is to properly look around the block or look around the city and look at all of the assets that are really available for community building. This has not been done well in Portland. I think City Hall still thinks of Portland as a rather homogenous, small, weird city when we're actually very close in population to Seattle, which is very close in population to San Francisco, and our demographics, our ethnic and racial makeup, our age bulges are really very similar. It's time for, for us to see ourselves as bigger than the kind of homogenous leadership has, uh, has enjoyed um, for 150 years. And I say this with, with great optimism and with shameless ambition, because any solution, every solution, and here's a chance to do it as we're all coming out of our homes, will require municipal governments to look and see what enormous uh, um, capital we own outside of institutional capital. And I'm talking about social capital, cultural capital, spiritual capital. We have the most amazing um, readiness of people to participate in local governance. Uh, Thank you. Oh, yeah, oh. Of course. Go ahead. No, please. Uh, that's all I intended to say. That it's it's an, uh, an issue of properly respecting, properly evaluating, and inviting people to participate uh, in, in in this lovely city. Thank you. If we maintain our current government structure, 
what city bureau or bureaus want to oversee and why? Yeah, trick question, because we have a, a tricky and odd uh, interpretation of what uh, a commission form of government uh, could be or should be. Uh, so yes, uh, if I'm on uh, city council taking the place of our much beloved Nick Fish, uh, I would ask for a combination of, of uh, two bureaus, either um, uh, Portland Police Bureau and then the Civic Life, uh, Office of Civic Life, or housing and transportation. And I say this because another feature of our form of government is these isolated, technically very capable, I wanna take nothing away from the kindness and creativity of people working at City Hall, uh, because I worked there for 10 years, from 2008, 2018. Uh, but this technique, this uh, uh, technical expertise, these revenue streams are siloed into jurisdictions that are not very good at sharing. And here again, that's because of the kind of uh, the commissioners, uh, the commission form uh, that's ultimately accountable for the work these folks produce or don't produce. So I would like transportation and housing first, ideally because this is a big city we live in now. Uh, transportation and housing need to be integrated into a single urban plan and not one chasing the other, which is sort of responsible for many of the gentrification problems we're seeing even now in East East Portland and North North Portland, uh, where transportation is leading the way. And the next thing you know, a Tongan Portland family has to move the, again the kids out of schools and again has to move their tiny church further and further east. Thank you. How would you address the public's significant concerns about police, community relations, uses, and officer accountability? We have my, about a minute and a half. My favorite question. <laughs> I have uh, been a part of great joy in working the Portland Police Bureau. I've also been humiliated by having a young police officer have her gun in my face in front of my son and our elderly neighbors and uh, thrown on the asphalt, wet asphalt, and handcuffed while they figured out, I suppose, I don't know why, no one has apologized to me yet, no one has explained to me yet, I suppose they had the wrong Mexican. And I'm making a joke here because I'm not Mexican, but you know, I imagine there's someone out there who did something really awful and this young woman was so adrenalated, I had to calm her down. Having, so said, what, that, go now, ahead. having said all that, our experience uh, with community policing uh, about 20 years of experience was sheer joy. And this is to get to your issue. A police officer should not be asked about accountability after he or she has made a split second decision about using lethal force. That relationship, which is a part of community policing, needs to happen every single day. If you ask police officers who are what's called public safety officers under community policing in any city, but especially ours. They will tell you about going to work every day, being so happy to be around people who have love and respect for them, who really value them protecting them, giving their lives to protect them from danger. We That's are out of time. Do you have one more thing you want to say about that? That's the kind of relationship officers need to have with the communities they police. A police Thank officer you. needs to know that the community has their back when they make that awfully lonely, terrible decision. Thank you very much. This has been the Voter's Guide. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19th. Please be an informed voter. Visit 411.org, that's vote411.org, to learn more about the candidate and ballot measures on your ballot and exercise your right to vote.